the venture capital market, the investing market needs to be disrupted. Howdy. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast, presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing due to Hippo Direct, and you can reach me at max at hippodirect.com for help using your podcast as a marketing tool. This is episode number 82, and today's guest is Jerry Hayes. He is one of my favorite professors of all time at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business, and he was my professor for his entrepreneurial finance and venture capital class, which just blew my mind. I had never experienced anything like that. In addition to that, he has sold three businesses, invested in dozens more, including everything from real estate to fried chicken, and now he is launching Dorio, which is the fantasy startup game. That is right. He is taking a fantasy football or fantasy gaming approach to the startup investing and venture capital world, which is pretty disruptive in itself. It is time for class to begin. Enjoy the show. All righty. We are here with Jerry Hayes, one of my favorite professors of all time from the great Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. Jerry, how are you doing today? I'm great, Max. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. This is pretty surreal. I mean, I feel like I was just in your entrepreneurial finance and venture capital class. And uh, I, think, I think I learned more things in your class that I had no idea about than any other class I took, uh, especially with your book, The Equity Bible. It's, it's pretty crazy. And uh, it, it's pretty clear you know a thing or two about the VC side and, and funding side of startups. I do. I've lived it, you know, it, and it's great. Uh, I, it's, just, it's just a great situation where I'm allowed to do what I teach and teach what I do. So I bring a lot of what happens in the real world into the classroom. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and I always enjoy the, stary, the stories you shared in class. So <laughs> we're going to get to Dorio, which is kind of your new pride and joy, your passion there, which I know you've been thinking about for a while. A uh, really, really cool thing you got going on with Fantasy Startup. But before we get to that, I want to dive into your background because you, I mean, have one of the most impressive entrepreneurial and, and VC and funding careers of, of anybody. So to start off, when you think back, and, it, and maybe it's your childhood, maybe it's sometime around school, I don't know, whenever it was, probably when you were two years old. When was your first exposure to entrepreneurship? Uh, it, you know, it actually, I got a paper out and it, I got a paper out when I was, uh, 10 years old and I had to pedal my bike, maybe two and a half miles just to get to my route. So I'd carry a bunch of, you know, 60, 70 papers on my back. And I had to do that because my father was breaking away and starting a food distribution company and we had no money. And uh, so I needed lunch money. I wanted a pair of Levi's, you know, this, uh, so I, you know, found a paper out and got a job. And, uh, from there, I just, I'm always hustling. <laughs> always hustling. That's the hashtag <laughs> or, or tattoo there, <laughs> but yeah, paper out. That's powerful. I know, uh, my dad, our founder and, uh, and president had a paper out as well. And he talks about how much he learned there. He actually had a story that one time he tried to do the entire route without touching the handlebars. Did you ever do daredevil stuff like that? Oh, no, but I, I, I really appreciate that because one of the things that I did was I, oh, I rode my bike, right? And I would stop on the sidewalk. And so I'm tossing these, these papers up onto the porch and I'd play like the Olympics of paper, up, of paper throwing. And I would throw them high, throw them low. And the whole goal was to land it, like arc it up. So it's like above the roof line and it lands perfectly in the middle of the porch, uh, you know? <laughs> And so you play these games, right? Because what else is there to do? I, I finally, the Sony Walkman came out and I was able to listen to music, <laughs> you know? Damn. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is going back a ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back when, you know, the, uh, you didn't take a record player around with you, I'm sure. No, but, yeah. No, but, but that's neat. Yeah, I'm sure it's, you got to find ways to entertain yourself and challenge yourself from then. So you 
there's kind of a trait there in that story that I think reflects well in the rest of your career is you like to challenge yourself and put yourself into challenging situations. So as you went on, as you started studying and eventually went to school, and, and I know law school as well, what were you thinking about that you'd be doing in your career? Uh, you know, honestly, I had no real idea what I would be doing. And I actually went down to the Kelly School, well, I went to IU, of course, and then I spent uh, the first semester, there was no direct admit at the time, uh, taking some classes in prereqs and bombing them. And I said, there's no way I'm going to the business school. So I actually became a political science major. I don't even have a business degree, interestingly enough. Or <laughs> yeah. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I have a political science major and I have a law degree. And I'm teaching at, in the finance department at the Kelly School. It's just it's bizarro. Uh, so I really had no aspirations. What I did do when I was in college is I started a painting company. That was my second sort of entrepreneurial move. And I would go on, uh, find houses to paint, and then I would hire college kids to paint those houses. So I, I got up to three crews, and I was doing about seventy-five dollars to $100,000 a year um, painting houses. And, uh, and so I knew that I had the c- capacity to run a company. And at that point, I was learning everything. You had to do the accounting. I was doing payroll, collecting money. Uh, fixing problems, working with customers, hunting for business. So I knew I had that inside of me. But honestly, when I graduated from school, I had no idea. It was, and so w- what had happened was uh, it was maybe like November 15th of 1990. And I saw in the Woodburn Library a pamphlet for the Governor's Fellowship. And it's this one-year program where you work in the Governor's office. And that, then it was Evan By. And I go, God, that looks really awesome. So I spend the next, it was a, the, the deadline was like November 30th. So I spent the next two weeks heads down writing an amazing essay and I mailed it in because there's no email at the time, right? And, mm-hmm. and then I forgot about it. I completely forgot about it. But I was for two weeks, I was completely dialed in. Like, this would be awesome. And then, I don't know, uh, I uh, ended up, that was my senior year, and I took a couple of classes in the summer to finish up, so I was graduating in the middle of the summer. My wife, not then my girlfriend, um, was staying with me, and we were at the Hyper working out, and one of my buddies comes up, he goes, hey, I heard you got a job. What? Because I wasn't looking, you know? He goes, yeah, you got, I heard you got a, the job at the governor's office, and I'm like, what? No, I haven't heard anything. And a week later, sure enough, they got a hold of me and said, congratulations, you're in the fellowship. It was huh. real. No political connections, no nothing. But I think it, what, it, uh, what it is a kind of symbolic of is if you, you want something really, really bad and you can breathe your emotion into it and then not contradict your thoughts behind that, that you know, there's a chance that it may manifest in your life. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think it, it, can, it can apply to anyone, no matter what your passion, what, what your interests are. Yeah. So, you were, so, so that's a pretty big change up. So you go... Uh, so the abbreviated version is you went from paper route to the government governor's office. <laughs> so, um, so that's a pretty, that's, that's kind of another step in a different direction than you'd expect for somebody who's such a well-renowned professor. What did you do after that, that brought you sort of back into the, the startup world or the venture world? Well, I, so I got into the governor's office. Then I ended up at the, a year later at the state Democratic headquarters working in the statewide campaigns. And then I became an environmental lobbyist. I was the lobbyist for the state Department of uh, Environmental Management. And then I got recruited in the, in, into the business interest to do lobbying there. So I was really in government affairs and I got a law degree. And so I had this career uh, in front of me that I could have been a partner at basically any of the law firms in Indianapolis um, because I had now four or five years of government affairs experience, worked in the governor's office in the state house. And I just said, I looked in the mirror and I said, this is no place for a young man or a young person. I said, you know, if I was going to be, if I was 65 or 70, this would be an awesome job, but not for where I want to go with my life. So I decided to leave it all and start over. And I started a, my first company, which was, this is where the internet is sort of taking off. So t- taking up to 1998, 1999, I just had this seed of a thought that, you know what, I'm going to get rid of real estate agents. They make too much money. They, they, <laughs> they, they, rob, they rob so many people of their equity. 
and there's good agents and there's bad, but you know, there's always that the 10% really are great. And then there's everyone else that uh, I felt they were just collecting money and not doing a whole lot of work. And um, so I said, I'm going to get rid of them. So I, so that's what I set out to do. Jerry, you know, I'm a licensed real estate agent, right? I'm, I'm sorry, man. I'm no, all, no, no, no. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. Person, so I'm just right there with you. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm kidding. I just want to mess with you. But no, that's cool. I mean, that shows how much you think outside the box. That was, was that Homia? That was Homia. Cool. So, so that was Homia. So you kind of were in the real estate world for a while. Yep. Um, and what, what made you switch up to your next thing, which I know is a different industry? So uh, we were, well, just a, the short story of, of Homia, we were killing it for, uh, we, we launched in 2000 with billboards in Indianapolis, like commission-free real estate. And then we backed it up with radio ads in, in the fall. And we damn near took, after about a year, 10% of the transactions out of the real estate, traditional real estate market into our oh, hands. It was unbelievable. We were getting... We were getting calls from the Justice Department because they were doing an investigation that one of the largest real estate agents in, or the agencies in, the, in Indianapolis was blackballing our listings and consumers were calling for anti-competitive practice types of things, right? So <laughs> it, was, it was really crazy. And, and here's this. There was companies back in 2000, right before the market crashed in April 2000, there was companies were going public raising you know, 75 to $100 million, revenue of 75,000, losing 60 million, you know? And um, then I'm in Indianapolis and I couldn't raise even 2 million bucks. And I was doing, at that time, on a run rate of doing a million five, making 300,000 a year. Oh my God. And, and right then, sowed the seeds for Dorio. And I, and I said, you know what? The, the venture capital market, the investing market needs to be disrupted. And from that point on, I said to myself, I'm going to disrupt this market in some way, shape or form. I don't know how, but I'm going to. So yeah, that, but it, it, the market crashed and then the unfortunate incident of 9-11 put us back. And then we had a, a million dollar funding commitment that fell through last minute for no reason other than there was a limited partner who couldn't cut a check. And then it just, I sold the company in 2003, just exhausted. Uh, it just, I got an MBA plus from that experience. Um, yeah. yeah. And I just, I, I quit. I just, I said, I'm done. I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done fighting the real estate agencies. We tried to expand in Ohio and, and Orlando two weeks before, you know, uh, you know, September of 2001. It was, it was, you know, one catastrophic thing happened after the next. So in 2003, I sold that company to a private equity firm in California who won't help you sell real estate. And then I just took a break. I was going to say, I'm, you mentioned the word exhausting. Like, I just feel exhausted hearing you talk about that. It sounds like <laughs> when you put so much of your heart and effort into something and then and you, you think you have another million dollars coming and it's not coming, like that, that's insane. How did you come back from that and go from being exhausted to you know, full-fledged having your heart and passion back in another business? Well, the interesting thing about that is that after the dust had settled, I started getting antsy again. And I realized, you know, gosh, I have learned so much. I've been through hell. Nothing really phases me anymore. You know, after going through that, I survived it. My family's intact. I'm still married. You know, hey, let's, let's get back on and give it another go. And at that time, my, my, I mentioned earlier that my father had a distribution company he had started, and he was distributing some specialty products, one of which was fried chicken, breading. And he <laughs> had built himself a nice little business selling fried chicken breading to, gosh, I don't know, call it 125 different like small grocery stores and convenience stores and had a nice little business, you know. That's a lot of chicken. A lot of, a lot of fried chicken. And there's other distributors that are like that. And uh, their manufacturer wanted to pull the plug on these specialty distributors and go broadliners uh, like U.S. Foods and Cisco. And so their entire businesses were all being threatened. And so I swore I'd never go into the family business, but my father asked me, he said, hey, I need you to come help us think about what we need to do here. And uh, so I did because, you know, my, uh, I had three brothers that were in the business with him. I, I was the only one that wasn't. And uh, I said, hey, your only solution is to go 
create a competing product and a competing brand and go, go take those customers. That's it. Right. And if you need help create, creating a brand, let's create the brand. Um, I'll take you through that process. And then we are literally going to have to go door to door and go pound away and fight for every customer. And so the name of the, the brand he was rec, uh, uh, representing was called Chester Fried. And we invented Charlie Big. So if you ever saw Charlie Big. Yeah. 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 Def- had it at, uh, what was it? Right Food Court had it? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so <laughs> we invented Charlie Biggs. And we did wow. a bunch of market research and, and we had this amazing plan. And we go out in 2005 and we're literally just door to door knocking and getting customers. It's like, yes, we're going to take those signs off. We're putting these signs up. We're going to grow your revenue. We're going to give you this marketing. Come with us. And, we, and the network wide ended up saving like 80% of their business. So they got through it. They, <laughs> the odds of succeeding was so low, but we were able to save 80% of their customers. And that sowed the seeds for the Charlie Biggs Food Company. And so I ran that with my brother, Jeff. He was sort of the internal person. I was the external person. And I started looking at market trends that fried chicken, fresh fried chicken is coming back into large grocery stores. So I started knocking on doors of large grocery chains. And um, fast forward, I don't know, four years later, we were doing $12 million of revenue selling fried chicken breading. <laughs> it was crazy. I literally three tractor trailer loads a week of fried chicken breading. I'm, I'm just imagining this right now. That's a hell of an image. <laughs> I got to learn how to drive a forklift. It was great, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's hands-on, tasty. Oh, uh, it, was, it was fun. Yeah. What's, you mentioned... 80%, you saved 80% of the business. Yeah. So this is obviously a business that was struggling at the time. And then you just totally, you know, chick, chicken flipped it. <laughs> well, let me take, look, the distributors were not struggling at the time. They had nice businesses repping this other person's product. But when we changed it over to Charlie Biggs, you know, you go to these customers and saying, hey, you've had this Chester Fried sign up on your, your building for the last 10 years. We're, we're going to change it to Charlie Biggs. You got to make that case to them that they're not going to lose business from it. And, mm-hmm. and so that, so it actually was a huge success. So they continued, they, they, each of those distributors saved 80% of their companies in terms of, of revenue. And then they were buying from the Charlie Biggs food company, which we had established. So they were buying through us and using the Charlie Biggs brand. And then interestingly enough, Max, so here it is, we get mm-hmm. through this thing. Next thing you know, we get this letter from this attorney in Maine saying, you must cease and desist all activities related to Charlie Biggs, you are violating our trademark. It's like, holy shit. Oh no. And it's, it's, and they call it an illegal word. It's like on look effort letter, like look effort, <laughs> we're coming after you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh shit, we're, we got a problem here. And uh, the problem is that if we don't have the trademark, someone's going to dispute our trademark as we were running through that process, we'd have to go to all those customers and say, you can't use Charlie Biggs. I mean, we, we were going to destroy like eight distributors in North America's businesses. You want to talk about pressure? Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's insane. Okay. So, so what happened next? You, you went up to Maine, you just gave oh, them yeah, a ton of, yeah, ton yeah, of fried yeah. chicken, bribed them, and then the rest is history? Yeah. yeah we, we had to go see them, right? And so it turned out to be a, a husband and wife who had a restaurant called Charlie Beads, different spelling, different pronunciation, but they had a little sauce company. And it was struggling, but they made it sound like it was big. And uh, basically, they said, buy our sauce company or, you know, we're not going to let you have this trademark. So we had to, you know, pay a couple hundred thousand dollars to buy their sauce company. And oh, wow. Yeah. So, but the story is unbelievable. It was, you want to talk about pressure. It was, yeah. there, there was lawyers screaming at each other over the shenanigans that were pulled. It was crazy. Is that the most high pressure situation you've ever been in? Uh, no. <laughs> <It gets laughs> Do you progressively mind sharing? Better. It's progressively better. I got, I got, uh, our, our company got sued over, over, you, I can't really go into the details, but there was, some, let's call it some internal fighting with the distributor. And uh, we got sued and, it was a good two and a half years and it was the lawsuit was out in, in Nevada and uh, it was a, it was a, a, a chess match between attorneys and we ended up settling. It was fine at the end, but 
you know, uh, they were trying to turn the heat on in every way they could, you know, um, yeah. it's kind of like a scorned, you know, someone who's been scorned and they got money and these, uh, gentlemen happen to have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money. So <laughs> they were willing, they were willing to fight. <laughs> so, so <laughs> your, your career, so like you're, you thrive in the exhausting and high pressure situations. So maybe, maybe you were meant to be like an ultra distance runner or something, but yeah, um, yeah. what do you, what tips do you have? I mean, there's obviously the, the positive sides and the very successful sides of your career. Uh, but when you get to kind of like the lows and, and, and the challenges and these pressure situations, uh, yeah. how do you come back? How do you thrive in those situations as opposed to just melting under the pressure? Yeah, I think that you have to have a higher level of thought that you know where you're going to take something. And I think I, when I look at a lot of entrepreneurs and I've worked with a lot of them, invested in a lot of them, mentored a lot of them, I think sometimes it's easy to kind of look around and say, hey, oh my gosh, this is happening to me and this is the end. I'm freaking out where, you know, this is just a moment. It's kind of like a wave in the ocean and you got to let that wave come through and pass and another wave is going to come. So you have to expect that when you go sit next to the ocean, waves are going to come. And there are going to be big waves and small waves and that kind of thing. And you've got to ride those waves, almost be in flow with them. And, but to do that, you have to almost get back, almost take some time every day to get in your attic and tell the story of what you want to get to happen in the future. Because if you don't have that, you are, you are going to be just whipsawed in this world because it's hard and it's competitive and people are not nice. And you know what? Not everyone's going to want you to win. And you just have to kind of look at that. That's the reality of the world. But if it were any different, then it would be quite boring. It, it, it would be. Yeah. It's a uh, life's a hell of a thing. I think it turns out to be. <laughs> so, yes, so there are, I mean, there's, there's a considerable amount of time between Charlie Biggs and, and your chicken business, we'll call it. And yeah. Dorio, I know you're a lot of stuff in the VC world. You have slain capital. You've been a professor for, several what i guess 15 years now as well of, of that decade what's the main thing you want to share from that about the biggest thing you've taken away from i guess the last decade if you will of your life yeah i'd say it was the hardest decade of my life it was my 40s so i'm 51 today and um wait actually today or like well no just it, it, i'm age 51 so okay a, well happy belated anyway yeah thank you so i'm uh, so the forties was the hardest emotionally for me. And I think everyone has sort of their, their, you walk into an abyss and try to figure out who you are and, and have that discovery. That was my forties. So, uh, I never wanted to be in the family business. And so, um, it was, it was just, it was not my passion. So I spent the last three or four years planning my exit out of the family business. We had to settle up the lawsuit and get through that. And then I was able to talk to my brother and say, hey, look, this company's big enough. Let's go find a private equity buyer. Take, take me out. It's not what I want to do. I'd invested in other companies, had some wins in, in that process. But I really, it was, a, it, was, um, it was a time for me to figure out, you know, you're doing a lot of things that you're adding value in other people's lives and you're doing a lot of things, but you're not really doing anything for yourself. And and you, this can't continue because the more that you go inward and you're not, and you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're depleted emotionally and you're not doing anything for yourself. You're not becoming a very good person. And I just didn't see my, I wasn't a, I wasn't a good person. I wasn't a, I wasn't a, I wasn't a light person. I was a heavy person, you know? And, I, and, uh, and, and so my, my takeaway uh, of that decade really comes down to anyone who really wants to, to, um, feel the drink the nectar of life take some time and, and, and truly step back and discover who are you and what is it that you really 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 want not just say oh i want to do this and do it it, it uh, i think it's a super important to have that sort of self-reflection and go inward um and have that figured out before you just start do doing stuff in the real world i totally agree yeah and you'll, you'll save a lot of time that way and and have the potential to find more happiness that way. What advice do you have for looking inward? Um, I think the I think the first step is uh, I, I to me it begins with either taking long walks quietly or meditating, but uh, uh, trying to slow your thought process down. And uh, along with that, 
um, is to suspend all negative beliefs about yourself and about the world and about other people. In other words, I think everyone in this world is gonna, will eventually make a decision, is this world uh, full of scarcity and limitation and competition, or is it full of abundance and opportunity and possibility? You can't look at the world in both ways. If you look at the world as both abundant and yes, it's, it, it, there's limit, it's limiting for you, you're contradicting yourself. So you have to be very clear with what the, uh, you know, what your belief systems are and you've got to suspend negative beliefs, you know, because you generate, we all generate, I, I saw this, this is interesting, Max. Um, I was talking about this in, in class the other day is that the average person has 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day. 80% of those thoughts are negative and 95% of those thoughts are repetitive. So the average person is doing, has, has 12,000 to 16,000 repetitive negative thoughts every day. <laughs> now that's the average person. And you take a look and you, you juxtapose that against the wealth distribution in the United States and you'll see that the average person has no financial wealth. They're hand to mouth and limit, limited savings, probably some debt, and you have the, the, the top 10% who are controlling all of the wealth. Now, I don't know if there's any correlation, I don't know if there's any studies, but damn it, if the average person is just thinking negative all the time, and now you look at the economic, you know, where that, where that place is economically, you would think that, okay, well, for me, if I want to get ahead in life, I should start thinking positive. <laughs> and start having yeah. beliefs, right? Right, yeah, I was gonna say, it, the numbers you threw out, if you could flip it, if it could be, 80% positive in it because you know you can't be positive all the time. I mean, I try to be, but you can't be positive all the time. 20% negative seems okay. Repetitive, I get because it just it's not feasible to only think of things once. But those are those are some incredible stats. Where'd you hear that, by the way? Do you remember where you picked that up? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I, I picked it. It's like the American Institute, Science Institute Foundation that did the the, the studies on the thoughts and then the basic economics wealth. I, I, I don't have the sources in front of me. I'd have to send them to okay. you. Oh, I was expecting like a full citation and MLA <laughs> format. <and everything>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the thing is, it's just like, okay, yeah, flip it. So what if your 80% of your thoughts were positive, right? Uh, instead, of, uh, instead of negative. And I think that's w really what it takes. You just have to have more positive, uh, a more positive outlook on things than negative. And I think that can really change a lot for anyone. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it, it ties back to doing things that you love. So, well, uh, I, I want to hold that thought because we'll get to s some things in that realm a little bit later. Imagine you started your own podcast. You're growing your brand, sharing your expertise, maybe even your terrible puns, and meeting fascinating people. That is awesome. Now, imagine all the hours you've lost every week due to the podcast's demands. Not so awesome. I am your podcast producer. Email me at max at hippodirect.com. Let's get to Dorio, which Dorio, it's spelled D-O-R-I-O-T, but rhymes with Oreo, correct? Rhymes with Oreo. In other words, you can say Dorio, or, you know, when I talk about disruption, you can also call it do riot. <laughs> do riot. Oh, I like that. Oh, a little, a little double entendre there. So this is, uh, you mentioned you thought about this first several years ago and when you first sort of got involved in the entrepreneurial world uh, in the funding experience you had. But this is now, you know, at the time of this recording, really coming to fruition and you're up to a lot of exciting things there. Can you walk us through, for anybody who's not familiar with it, can you walk us through what Dorio or Do Riot is? Sure. So Dorio is a, what I'm hoping to build is a venture capital cooperative. Well, hoping I will build a venture capital cooperative. There we so go. It's named after the inventor of venture capital, George Dorio, who, who launched the first venture capital fund in 1946. He was actually a Harvard professor who taught what I taught, interestingly enough. And <laughs> so he was out launching and do, investing in startups um, and building this fund at the same time he was in the classroom teaching entrepreneurs how to launch companies. Uh, extraordinary man, very highly respected. The top VCs in the United States all revere him as the man who grinded it out and shaped the industry. 
The interesting thing about it was that George Dorio's venture fund was publicly traded. So in other words, you and I at that time could have bought some stock in that venture fund. And over the course of 20 years, he earned a 23% internal rate of return on invested capital, which that, that became the bellwether for the venture industry, right? If you can get 25% internal rate of return against the S&P's 8 to 12% each year, then you're going to be able to raise a lot of money and invest in startups. Now, what had happened was the wealthy and connected then turned to a structure called a limited partnership to make venture capital investing inaccessible to the common person. So you had to be wealthy and connected to get into these venture funds. And that's still the case today. No one can just go, hey, I'd like to invest in Kleiner Perkins Venture Fund or our Andreessen Horowitz. You don't get those opportunities. There's so much demand by the wealthy and connected and, and the pension funds and institutional investors to get into those funds, they're completely not accessible. So then that leaves, okay, if you, you can't get into those funds, how do you get involved with venture investing? Well, the next step is you got to be a millionaire. So based on SEC rules, it's been, you, you've got to have either a million dollars of net worth beyond your first home or you're making $250,000 a year. Well, we all know that if you look at the economics or the, the statistics, um, that's only about 14 million households that that applies to, which, you know, that's 10% of the United States. We have moved into an ownership society. Since the 1960s, it was an income society, but they got, but we've, get, we've gotten rid of all the unions. You look at the CEO compensation against the compensation for employees. It's getting wider and wider because CEOs are getting rewarded for stock price. So if you don't own stock in a company, <clears throat> you're not really a player in the economy, in my, in my opinion. So owning homes, owning stock, uh, that is the future, is owning assets. And if you look at all the tax laws, it is all driven around people to own assets. So what happens to the 90% who are not investing in startups, which is where all the major growth is happening in our economy, how do we get them included? You can't, because we're not set up to include them. They're not sophisticated enough like VCs to, uh, or like angel investors, or have the means to, to cut checks, and they can't hand their money over to a VC to, to manage their money because they don't do that. They won't raise money from everyday people. So I think this is a, this is a huge crime and an opportunity to uh, bring millions of people into the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So what I envision is, why don't we allow people to be able to invest as little as a dollar in a startup? And you say, well, that sounds silly. Okay, but let's, let's put this in context. If you would put $10, $10 in Amazon back in 1994, the value of that $10 today, had you not sold, would be like $70,000. That, oh that would mean 1000 bucks in Amazon would be worth $70 million, Right? Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. If, if you put, you know... Congrats to whoever did that, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, but there was, there, was, there was, at that time, there was um, 20 rich people who put 50 k into to Jeff Bezos' company. So they're all billionaires today. Yeah. And then and, and if you... If you put $5,000 into Uber, that $5,000 would be worth like $1.2 million. Jeez, so, I, so think about this, think about this, Max. Think, think so. if there was a platform where Uber, the, the managers would say, hey, let's go to Dorio and let's raise $10 million and let's bring all our Uber drivers into the mix and, and go to the Uber drivers. Hey, you guys are driving for us. We love you. You're helping us. How about, if you would like, would you like to buy a little bit of stock in our company? And, and some of the Uber drivers goes, heck yeah, I, I believe in this. Well, you know what? You could have made them rich. And yeah. they're, the, they're, they're, they're humping it out every day for you, right? But you know who got rich? A very elite few of venture investors got rich. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make sense to me, right? The, the, all these companies need, uh, need the consumers, the everyday people, to buy their products, download their apps, you know, they drive their, you know, be a part of their, their sort of their test networks or whatever. And yet they don't have an opportunity to invest in the companies. Yeah. Go to Uber driver and they put a thousand dollars in the IPO. You know, what it's worth today, 750 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. So, so the industry is just sucking every bit of growth out of these startups, go from zero to massive growth, suck all the growth out and then give it to the fools. Hey, take, go public and, and let everyone think that this is a lot of growth. And 
you know, Uber goes public at 65 billion or whatever the number was, and you want 10 extra money, it's gotta be a $650 billion company. The odds yeah. of that are one to none, and Slim left town a long time ago, right? <laughs> Shout so, out Slim Shady. <laughs> yeah, Shady. So who, who's giving opportunity to the people, to 90% of the public who feel disenfranchised from this? And my, my bet, there's gotta be at least 5 million people out there who would love to invest, put 10 bucks in a startup, or 25 bucks in a startup. The key yeah, is- It's such a low risk thing from the, exactly. from the consumer. Or- the key is it's like poker, right? So you've got to put not just 10 bucks in one, you've got to put 10 bucks in 25. So invest $250 a year, but get it in 25 startups. 20 of them are going to fail, five will win, two will pay you back, and then three are going to give you the return. And you get to have a bunch of fun watching these companies grow from seed to something or die. It's such a cool concept. And with Dorio, I, you use the term fantasy startup, which right. I think helps to visualize and internalize it. Well, you see, here's the thing, is that what is the number one reason people won't do it? It's fear. They don't know what they're doing. So if someone's afraid of something, they will shy away from it. People don't know what the word venture capital means. People don't understand you know, what participating preferred securities mean. And none of that really matters. What they do understand is stock price. And so we're launching a game called Fantasy Startup to teach millions of people how the game works, that let them play the game as if they were actually investing their real money, see it, and then make them comfortable and say, hey, you're doing it in pretend world, let's do it in the real world. Let's create a venture capital cooperative and let's go compete with VCs. That's amazing because it's, you take the fear out of it. Absolutely. To your point, how does this work? Like if, if we're looking at the most basic level, if I'm a person who, and this is true because I'm interested in this, but I'm a person who is interested in getting involved with Dorio and, and getting involved in this fantasy startup world, what does it look like from, from my perspective? So it's gonna be a 10 week game and Monday through Friday, there's gonna be one deal. When you set up, your, when you set up uh, your account on the game, you're gonna get some cash. We're not talking like millions of dollars because we're gonna be playing the max amount of cash you can play with in the game is a thousand because I want people to see hey, I can play with a thousand bucks and see what, and I can turn it into 3000. I want people to understand, yes, you can. This is what's happening in this world. Yeah. So you get your bank account, right? And then there would be a startup for the day. There would be a little bit of a pitch and from an analyst and we'll give you three or four bullet points and what market and what the valuation is. And you can decide whether you want to put money into it. So you just say, I'll put 10 bucks in or I'll put 25 bucks in. And then you'll get to see everyone else you can create your own league. You can join other people's leagues if it, if it, when you're invited. Um, and you can just, you, you're competing against everyone else. You get to see who made what, who put what amount of money into that company. And then over that ensuing 10 days of that decision will be the equivalent of 10 years for that life cycle of that company. So like the oh. next could be like, hey, the company just raised a series A. You invested at a buck. Now the stock price is $4. Congratulations. And then you, you can see how it sort of changes your portfolio value. And then there could be another raise and another bump up in price. And then it could be the company couldn't get product out. They failed. You lost it all. Or it could be a really big win. And you just turned, you know, your $10 into 300 bucks. Congratulations. This is really cool because I'm thinking back to when I was in your class and you did this thing in class. I'm not sure if you still do it called the venture game. And you're kind of notorious around Kelly and Bloomington. Oh, probably the world as well for doing this venture game and doing, which I think was a six or eight week simulation where yeah. you would pitch a product. I remember I still, I pitched the tile app and we had good, you remember uh, that. yeah, good, good feedback on the pitch. Um, and then I realized I was good at pitching and the marketing side of things. Then I had no sort of concept on the equity side of things. So we did, we did not win as we got into series A and series B and all that, but clearly you have, done this sort of thing before and I'm sure it helped form this this business what what's the biggest thing you've taken away from from doing this sort of thing or simulation uh, or fantasy I guess what's the biggest thing you've taken away from doing it in class that gave you the confidence and you know ability to, to turn this into actually a real business and and go outside the classroom with it well so interestingly enough uh, I learned a lot of gaming mechanics as you know because I played around and tinkered with that game for five years leading up to when you took it. And if you look at all the statistics, people just learn so much more in context through gaming than they ever will by reading a book. 
And you, and as you, as you pointed out in that, in that classic room experience, you know, you got to learn what it means to pitch and you also got to feel that pressure and stress of trying to raise money and you couldn't raise the money. Right. Yeah. A uh, sore and, subject. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, but it provide it provides a learning, it, you know, a, it was a safe learning, uh, piece for you. Right. And you carry that with you as a, as an asset. Uh, I flipped that around and said, okay, how do we, can we, how can we, how can we teach a hundred million people how to invest in startups without them taking on risk and just having a ton of fun doing it. And so it's really, I, you, you just can't teach people how to start up and invest. They just have to do it. And Naval Ravikan, who's the CEO of AngelList, he sent out a tweet in August of this year, of last year saying, you know, everyone should be learning startup investing skills. Accredited investing rules prevent, prevent it from happening. What he's saying is, if you're not a millionaire, you're not learning because you're not doing. If you're not doing, you're never going to get this. So this is our, this is my, you know, my sort of gift to the world is that, you know, anyone who wants to learn how to be a startup investor, even if you're in high school, you will learn it the right way through fantasy startup. And you have fun doing it. And have fun. Like, look, at yeah. the, look at the odds of this, the statistics. 57 millennials believe startups are the most important part of the economy. Most of them are not engaged because they're not entrepreneurs and they're not millionaires. You have 11 million high school kids who want to be entrepreneurs. You have $160 million, a billion dollars a year of illegal sports betting. You have 60 million fantasy sports players. Uh, you look at, you've got, you got, you know, record numbers of college graduates who want to start companies. We have a, we love gaming, we love betting, and we love entrepreneurship in this country. So the fantasy startup sort of brings it all together. Yeah, yeah, it's really a magical mix there. <laughs> Let's get to a segment on inspiration and creativity. And, and you touched on this a little bit about kind of, what drives you and some of the experience you've had. But when you think about it holistically, how do you come up with your creative ideas? Like what, what helps to inspire your creativity and, and your new business ideas? I, I, that's it, such a, a great question, Max, and it's such a hard question. You know, I don't believe that I'm coming up with my own original ideas, if that makes sense. I absolutely believe that I, am, I have a gift of uh, I'm a portal of ideas, ideas flow to me. They come to me and, and maybe I just made a decision a long time ago that I just see this world as just nothing but one opportunity after the next. But I have all sorts of ideas that come to me all the time, but I don't think they're mine. I think that other people are getting these same ideas. They're just, the choice is whether you act on that idea or you don't act on that idea. Right. Uh, so to me, it's like I'm, you're, all you have to do is just look and watch and pay attention. And every, there's problems all, they're just, you know, everyone's got things that they'd love to have resolved. And I think mainly you start with yourself. Like, you know, I don't want to use a real estate agent. So I start a company, you know, uh, to try to get rid of the industry. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I want, you know what I want? I want to be able to have the ability to cut, you know, hundred dollar checks in 500 companies versus one, one check, 50,000 in one company, you know? Uh, I, I look at a venture fund is like going to, going to Vegas, but yet it's actually charity with an upside, you know? But so yeah, I, yeah. I, I want to spread my money out, right? I want to watch the game. Watching is funner than just one company stressing out whether that company's going to be successful or not. So Doria, I, I, it, it's, it's scratching my own itch, right? So. Yeah. Sometimes you just, your inspirations just come from, God, what do I want in this world? And if you want it, chances are other people that want it too. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. I, I, by the way, I love that phrase you use, portal of idea. I, th I think you need to introduce yourself that way because that, that's very <laughs> descriptive and unique there. Never heard that before. On that note, you talked earlier about taking a walk or meditation. What other things do you like to do? What other hobbies do you have outside of your work world that help you free your mind? Oh man, I'll tell you, I love, I love to cook. I love to cook. And, uh, I don't, I, I don't follow recipes. It is not my thing. I love to just walk into the kitchen and see what's there and like make up a gourmet meal for my family and present it, all of it, you know, kind of as a, just, I, 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 I give a lot of love through food. And yeah, I, yeah. I, if I could just cook every day for my kids, 
<laughs> you know, build a, a big company and cook every day for my kids and my wife, you know, that would be in, you know, be able to go on runs with my dog. I'd just be, it'd be awesome. Yeah. Maybe like a, a fried chicken company or, or something yeah. like that. What's funny is that I, I bet you I had a total of maybe call it 20 pounds of fried chicken over that 10 years. <laughs> you know? Oh man, that's like the past two weeks for me, but yeah. <laughs> I don't I I love it don't get me wrong I love it but you know right no no I, I yeah there's definitely pros and cons about it it's funny what you said about how you approach cooking and recipes because I I heard a long time ago that one way to think about sort of the mindset of entrepreneurs versus people who prefer to work for somebody else is that somebody who works for somebody else will often when they go to cook they'll go strictly off a recipe and it's all recipe focused whereas an entrepreneur will walk into the kitchen and see what ingredients there are, okay, what can I whip up today and, and not have a, a drawn out plan of what it is until you actually start doing it and, and see what you have available to you. And so like you are like the living example of that. Yeah, I definitely fit that archetype. Absolutely. <laughs> what about on the, the resources side? And, and this can tie to, it kind of ties to people that inspire you as well. So on this note, what, I mean, I remember you used to always send us, when I was your student, you used to always send us TechCrunch articles. I think that was the first time I actually heard of TechCrunch. But mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of a two-part thing. One is, what sites or, or, or publishers do you, do you frequently look to for advice in the startup and business world? And two, are there any specific people? Like you mentioned Naval earlier, who mm -hmm. I heard his first episode on uh, the Tim Ferriss show and was just absolutely blown away by him. But I'm curious who else stands out to you in that realm as well. Um, well, Naval, definitely. Uh, Fred Wilson is another person that I really pay attention to. I think whenever he puts some information out about the venture world, I, he's, he's typically on point. I, I can't remember a time when he wasn't on point. Also, I, I pay attention to Ray Dalio. He's, you know, he's yeah. a head, he, I really pay attention to him. I think that his no-nonsense approach of, of you know, being fully transparent, I think, is refreshing. And it's not for everyone. I can remember I was in a, I was in a wedding. I was at a wedding in, in, in Tuscany of all places, former student. And one of, one of their friends actually worked for Ray Dalio. And he just said, I couldn't take it. It was just too much for me. <laughs> and, and so, but, but the way he described it, it, it sounds, you know, like that's brutal. But man, uh, if you are in search of the truth, there, there's no better environment to go to. So I pay attention to, 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 to him. Uh, when I think about resources, uh, man, YouTube is just, YouTube has just been a huge part of my life. And what I'm saying to you is that I'm able to listen to audio tapes of Napoleon Hill. I'm able to listen to, uh, to, to lectures from Neville Goddard. Um, these, these gentlemen were early, early, you know, night, early 90s, mid 90s into sort of the new thought era about, you know, this sort of this, this, this bridge or this harmonization between your body and your imagination. And it is, uh, it, there's, uh, there's nothing better than I get up and, you know, I go do a weight workout and I'm listening to Neville Goddard and then I go for a run and I'm listening to Napoleon Hill with my dog. And I, I, I probably listen to easily 500 hours worth of this stuff. It's like, now I'm just hearing the same stuff over and over again. But <laughs> what an absolute resource that's been. That's interesting because it sounds like it's more from the audio standpoint. What would you say your, your split is, your ratio of listening to audio on YouTube versus actually consuming video and actually looking at the screen? I do not consume video. I, it's all audio for me. Wow. All right. Cool. All right. Well, cool for the podcast world. So let's get to a fan favorite segment called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week! Okay. <laughs> Award-winning harmonica. Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. This is where we talk about a campaign or, or brand that caught our attention. And there's something you mentioned about Robin Hood. Do you mind explaining to us what that is and why they caught your attention? Yeah, so uh, obviously I'm in, the, I'm, I'm in the fintech space, so I pay attention to all things fintech just not only here in the US, but globally, Robinhood is, is a very recent phenomenon. And they are, they have, they've transformed the online stock trading industry literally overnight. 
so stock trading has been around and you know, I used to have a broker in the early nineties, but then I started using E-Trade. So I've been using E-Trade for you know, 20 some odd years. So they didn't invent anything new, but they went to zero commission trading and they built a, they were, went mobile first in, in a beautiful design, which is very attractive to millennials. And you know, uh, the um, financial literacy is still a very new thing for millennials. There's a lot of young people who don't understand money at all. So there was a market, no question, for what they were doing. What was interesting to me is before they even launched their product, they were up to a million plus uh, pre-registrations for uh, to set up an account. And, and, and it happened virtually in just a matter of a few months. And, and, and so someone had picked, them, picked up a, an article from them writing something on Medium or it was a, uh, something on Twitter. And then and they, they took that and they put it over on Hacker News and says, I don't believe uh, I don't believe they can do zero commission trading. And it created this huge debate in of all these inside baseball players about how they're doing it. And so <laughs> what that did was like, well, I'm going to download to find out how they're going to do it. Right. And, and it just exploded just literally in a few months. And you just think about how much money you would have to spend. Or one would have to spend on ads to get to a million pre-registrations for a product. Yeah. You can't even think of it. It's insane. Right. So, so the, the, the moral of the story for me is uh, even when I'm thinking about fantasy startup, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at influencers. Uh, you know, what kind of influencer would, would love to play this game or who would love to help us educate the, you know, millions of people on how to invest in startups? Because I think our shot at success in terms of massive appeal would happen better through one of these sort of obscure channels as opposed to just dropping a million dollars of, of ads. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, who comes to mind right away with that is, and this is, this is an example, but yeah, who knows Tim Ferriss, for example, like somebody like him who has such a, a, such large attention to everything he does in his newsletter, five bullet Friday, he literally shares out every week, five things that he's interested in are pretty unique and cool and new a pitch to somebody like that. Like if, if that actually got, picked up and got traction mm -hmm. that goes so much farther than actually you know being super smart or expensive with your facebook and instagram ad spend or no how how many times you post on linkedin so that, that that's that's true as far as influencers go for this are you looking for people that are really big on instagram or have a great reputation on sites like hacker TechCrunch, or forbes inc, inc entrepreneur just to name all of them <laughs> like that. Yeah, I, I think any and all of them. So we did a test uh, back in September just to see, all right, how many people really want to play this game? So we dropped, I, I want to say maybe $1,500 of ads and we dropped them in all, we, we split it up between Austin, San Francisco and Indianapolis. And just to see kind of, you know, how they would all perform. Yeah. And we, 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 we use only, Instagram, Snap, and Facebook. Our Facebook ads suck so bad because there's too much text. So they don't, we just discounted them all together. So let's just say <laughs> Instagram and, and, and Snap is what, what, what was working for us. A, a young VC in a uh, venture fund out in San Francisco sees our ad on Instagram, goes to the site, sets up an account, and then, and then sets up a referral link and puts it out on our Slack channel. And from that, right there, we got 150 signups. Wow. Yeah, from that one post on a Slack, an internal Slack channel. And that, and that includes, mind you, 70 from the startup community in Singapore. Wow. Well, that's, I mean, that's word of mouth in real yeah. life, word of mouth in, uh, I guess, digital or, or workplace cooperative word of mouth form. But you see the power of that. Yeah, exactly. So we know there's something there. We, and we've got signups now from people from Harvard, from Yale. Stanford, Berkeley, New York Stern, Northwestern, IU, of course. Uh, got, <laughs> I was gonna, I hope so. We got, we got, we, I mean, it's the quality of the signups that we're getting. It, it's amazing. Let's get to a segment called The Unusual. So we're going to get very unusual. Couldn't have guessed that from the name of the segment. But pet peeves, quirks, and weird talents. So what's your biggest pet peeve? Pettiness. That's so petty. Petty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Can you use an example of that? You know what? I'll give you an example from what happened yesterday. I am. Uh, I invested in two young ladies who were trying to build a sort of positive media for women's company. 
I, I, they're, I love them like my daughters. And it didn't work out. Uh, another company out of Boston uh, in the sort of women's, uh, women's college market swoops in and wants to buy the company. And they come in and they say, well, you know, here's what we'll buy you for. We'll give you, we'll just give a press release out to the world that we bought you, but we're not going to give you any money, you know? And I just, okay, we got a little money out of them and they screwed up in the closing docs and they didn't have a transfer of the, uh, of the trademark over, you know, they didn't make sure that the trademark was transferred over at the closing. So now they're coming back to us and they're saying, Hey, we need to, you guys to sign this document and then, and then go to the U S patent and trademark office and file it so we can get that trademark transferred over. No problem. And, and so my, you know, these girls, they don't know what to do. So they call me and I, and I, and I bring my trademark attorney in and I say, you know, he'll take care of this. You know, I, I, I I'm sure you guys won't, will be happy to pay the hundred bucks that it's going to cost him to do this. And they said, no, our agreement says that you take care of your side of the legal fees and we take care of our side of the legal fees. And like, that's, that's not shrewd business. That's just pettiness. It's just yeah. smallness and pettiness, you know? And that, that stuff just drives me up the wall because I, you know, we have to be thinking bigger and more abundant than, you know, fighting over a few pennies. I mean, they could have just said, heck yeah, we'll do that. And if we don't sign those documents, they're going to be spending literally probably 200 X that trying to make this happen, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Going to- yeah. Stupid, you know? Yeah. That's, oh, that's, that's so frustrating. Yeah. How about on the, in terms of quirks? So is there an aspect of your personality that maybe your, your family or, or students or somebody calls you out for that's a little bit quirky, but it's just, just true to who you are? Um, I scare people. <laughs> you work in a haunted house. I don't know if it's intimidating or what, but I've been told many a times, which is, I, I never see myself as this, that I'm scary. I'm intimidating or scary. And I, and it's probably because, you know, I get very, I get in my head and I'm thinking about something and, and I get really intense and, and that vibe gets pushed out on other people, you know, but I don't like, it's, it's an inward thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't work on it. Yeah, that, that's funny. I think it, well, I, I think in the, the venture capital space, there's kind of like an intimidation factor to begin with. So it kind of, right. kind of fits in there. I, I do remember being in your class a little bit intimidated, intimidated of you. I'm not, I'm not going to say super intimidated, but I, I, I see a little bit of what you mean there. But I think that's, that can be a good thing to have in business <laughs> because yeah. obviously you kind of, kind of have upper hand there. And then how about weird talents? So is there something that's completely random that you're really, really good at, but it has no impact whatsoever on your business. I haven't discovered it yet. <laughs> they're not, they're not like, a, uh, I'm sure I've got something. I've not discovered it yet. Yeah. There's not like a, a memory trick or like a, you know, you, you, um, you're very flexible. I'm sure you're very flexible. Uh, you know what? I have one. I have one. And actually this, this runs in the area of quirks. It drives my wife nuts. Have you ever played Euchre, Max? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's been a while, but yes. Okay, it, it, it's been a minute. All right, but you know, you get five cards and it's Trump and all that. After like two two hands, I do a throwdown because I know exactly how it's going to play out, and it drives her insane. <laughs> <laughs> a throwdown? You mean like an emphatic I like? Like, look, like, like, I'll give you the two points here. Take it. And she's like, "No, we're going to play this out." Like, it doesn't matter. You understand? It, she c- cannot stand it. But I, you know. They, they want to play the other half of the hand. And I'm like, oh, let's move to the next one. I already know what this is going to happen. <laughs> there you go. Always <laughs> thinking. <laughs> All, right. All right. So let's wrap up with some rapid fire Q&A. You ready for it? Yep. All right. Let's get wild. What's your favorite place you've ever traveled to? Croatia. Any particular city? Split. What is... Other than any you've been personally involved with, what would you say is your favorite VC firm of all time? Uh, Union Square Ventures. And it, we know it's not fried chicken, at least, or I'm not going to let you say fried chicken based on your consumption data on it, <laughs> your self-consumption data of it. But if you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would that be? One food or one dish? Like one? Like oh, one oh, uh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll give it to you. You could be a dish. Okay. Um, it would be, 
a everything bagel toasted with butter with avocado, tomato, salt, and pepper. Very specific. I like it. That sounds good. And then if you think back, what do you think is the hardest you've ever laughed? What caused it? Um, boy, that's a tough one. Hardest I've ever laughed. We can just dig deep. I, I, I laughed with my wife. She doesn't, she typically has never made me laugh, but she, we were out in a cabin hanging out and having a few drinks and she she found some spirit man and just said something that just i was la- i was on the floor laughing you know <laughs> and it was in the context like i would never date a 25 year old man you know because she's like 45 at the time like like it's so completely out of context but she was describing she was i would just run the other way and it was just the way she was talking it was just hilarious so yeah that got me on the floor. so that got you on the floor of the cab <laughs> all right <laughs> All right. Well, Jerry, thank you so much. This has been so cool reconnecting and and hearing more about your background and also the really, really exciting things you're up to with Dorio. Before we sign off here, where is the best place for people to connect with you personally? And where is the best place for people to sign up for Dorio? Uh, Yeah, to sign up for Dorio, it's just go to, or Fantasy Startup, you go to fantasystartup.com or dorio.com, pre-register. The game's going to launch. We're building the game now. The game's going to launch in, in May or June, and it'll be a 10-week game, and it's free to play. So pre-register now, and you'll have some advantages um, registering now as opposed to uh, registering when the game goes out. And then to contact me directly, you can uh, send an email to me at gahays at indiana.edu, or you can just look on the IU website at Kelly School to find me. Perfect. So... Awesome. Definitely. We'll be signing up for Dorio and, and uh, I'm sure anybody who will is in for a good time there and, and, and to learn a lot. And then last thing, final thoughts, the stage is yours. It could be a quote or, or a line or just kind of words of wisdom you have, whatever you want, send us off here. Believe the world is abundant and abundantly yours. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing your story and tips and wisdom and advice. And thank you, Wild Listeners, for tuning in to another episode. If you want to hear more wild stories like this one, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find more marketing and business growth resources on our blog at hippodirect.com slash blog and our newsletter at hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That newsletter is the Hippo Digest, and it's your place for wild marketing ideas every single week. And of course, of course, make sure to say, hey, howdy, how you doing, how, you know, all those on your favorite social media platforms at the handles Hippo Direct and Max Brandstetter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!